Hello, and welcome to another Ancient Warfare Magazine podcast. Uh, we're using a, a, a new uh, piece of software today to get you get us live to you on YouTube. If you're watching, I'm sorry, um, with a fancy new intro. And today we're going to talk about the latest issue of Ancient Warfare Magazine, issue 13.2, which deals with geography and warfare in the ancient world. And um, we've got some questions that have been submitted to us by our patrons and on our Facebook page and social media. And one question that came up from several people deals with maps in the ancient world, which is um, a very relevant question and one that I happen to know is not dealt with in the issue. Um, so let's talk maps. Um, do we know what maps were like in the ancient world? Were they used by ancient generals? Were they state secrets? Were there specialized survey mapping units and navies? Um, there's quite a bit of stuff to talk about, and some things we're going to have to say, don't know, and some things we probably can say something about. Who wants to start well, with that? We can start by saying they did have maps, but they're not maps as we know them, um, that the the, the ancient world maps were very much itineraries, um, that they had locations, perhaps geographical features, but very much in a linear fashion, like the Putinger table and a couple of other fragments of maps that survive um, that tell you there's a city, there's a road, there's a river, there's a city, there might be five days between. Um, and that those maps are often miss out things that you might expect them to have because we think of that location as being an important one but it's and it, it would be between the two locations on the ancient map um but it's not there because it's not part of that itinerary i suppose mm -hmm. um and we have the ancient periplus peripluses periply i'm not sure what the plural of periplus is um and they of course are the sailings around which we've got for africa the Eurythraean sea the black sea and a couple of others and they are the same they are you sail for this many days you come to a port you sail for this many days you come to a river you can trade here um we know that there are people who are sent out to do these surveying uh some of them of course have been plagued with no that person never existed like P um, pythias um and and a couple of others but then we know that those others were sent and if Lindsay was here he would tell us all about uh, Germanicus um, so those missions are sort of sponsored we also know that people provided maps to people like Pompey of the local area um, so I suppose they must have been secretive but then Augustus posted a map of the Roman Empire so they can't be that secretive so and Alexander the Great had his own specialist corps of surveyors uh, known as the Bema Tistae uh, who uh, would follow his army around as he uh, you know, uh, went into Asia and his various travels, and they would measure all of the distances as they uh, progressed. So there, yeah, there was, well, at least with his army, a, a group of people who uh, specialized in doing these measurements. Yeah, I think there's a, an expectation in mapping. You know, when you see people put online the real map of the world, not the not the shrunken version to make Europe bigger and Africa smaller. Um, that when you see the real dimensions of the world, people go, "What's that? That's not the map I'm used to seeing." And the funny thing, of course, about that is the con continuity of that idea. When you go back and you look at the early exploration maps of America in the in the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, when you look at the early discovery maps of Australia and New Zealand, for instance, um, they're not the maps we expect either. They're you know they're they're a bit wonky. They're missing things out. They haven't realized that an isthmus is a island or an island is an isthmus. Um, and I think the ancient world maps, again, they, what they wanted from a map was not this geographical drone-like satellite photo. They wanted how far between drinking spots. That's a, you know. So I think that the maps of the ancient world gave the material that they wanted. Um, they didn't. Uh, necessarily when we say measured distances it's not you know the heights of mountains the it's just four days march you know this many leagues this many um you know that sort of stuff it is interesting to, to emphasize the difference between the, the maps for use on land and the maps for use at sea the periplus it is 
it literally means the sort of sailing around. So you just, for for instance, for the uh, map that Arian made, the um, the author who also described Alexander, he starts, I forget if it's Trabzon or at Byzantium, and then he goes, basically sails east into the uh, Black Sea and just goes all the way around this, the, the coast of the sea till he gets back to the point where he started. Hmm. Um, which potentially says a lot about how the ancients preferred to sail the sea instead of, you know, he might go straight, more or less straight north from the, co the coast of Turkey and end up in the Crimea. Um, but instead they go around so they can keep the shore nearby. Um, while the, the land maps are the network map, is that a good way to put it? Um, I'm not sure if everybody's seen the Partinger map and here we have a disadvantage of a podcast where we don't have any visual materials unless Angus can just pop up a picture of the putting a map right now. Um, but it is a, how would you describe it, Mark? Or did I catch somebody uh, unawares here? Well, I, I, the, the, I, I think that many of the uh, itinerary style maps, itinerarium, they were, they were kind of like a map of, e, of uh, for example, the uh, London Underground or the New York City subway. It wasn't so much that you were uh, trying to create a necessarily a, an accurate uh, representation in space of all of these various places, but you were more or less saying, if you want to get from this place, this city, point A, to uh, point B and C and D, you have to first go to city B, city C, city D, and that's your itinerary as you go along and mm -hmm. you know the distances. And and I think that one of the reasons for these things is because the routes to various places, uh, it, the, the overland route that is as the crow flies, as is sometimes said, uh, would be impossible to take. So if you wanted a, the, the straight distance, it would be impossible. So you would actually be going from maybe to another city a little out of your way, but it would probably be faster and easier to do it uh, that way. Yeah, so importantly, direction is not indicated. No. So you just, it's just, you have to know what the nearby city is that the, is the first on your route, and then you go from there, you take it from there, from there, from there. I'm, I'm going to use audio visual material and, and talk about the fact that, you know, the very first uh, roadmaps in the 19th century are exactly the same, that they are a single line to tell you how to get from London to Oxford. And they're, a, they're a straight up and down. They're not directional. They're not giving you any side roads. They're going, no, no, this road. So I think that that kind of map actually lasts a lot longer than than our expectations of maps. So the, it's exactly the, what Herodotus is giving in terms of the hmm. progress of the Persian army when they're sort of crossing across Asia Minor, that it is one location after another, but it's not, you know, that there are some of the obvious trading stops that you might mention later on in terms of the Silk Route. Um, and the Persian Royal Road that just do mm. not get a get a look in because he, he is going on a, um, a tried and tested known Persian military as such. Yeah, so it's it's the downfall of it. It's like in terms of uh, if you go to Caesar and the survey of the British coastline that he has done before his arrival in Britain. It um, their mapping and their surveying of the of the coastline of Britain comes up with that shortcoming of it. it they miss out the details of the the, the deep harbors or whatnot along mm, the coastline mm. and it's exactly what you mentioned before the the sort of the coast uh, exploration of australia early on and the fact that you know you've got james cook sailing straight past sydney harbor port jackson um, because <laughs> he doesn't actually properly investigate these things mm, mm, as he goes mm. along the coast it's only later on that the extent of it is realized and same with the romans mm. Yeah, I think it's it's, it's an amazing um, when we you know when you get a um, an ancient history book or a translation like Herodotus and you see the map or Alexander's conquests, mm. you see the map and you you visualize based on the map of where they went and how far they got, and I think you know that idea of being on the ground and marching four days doesn't really matter what direction or where you're going as long as there's food and water between those spots. Um, and that so that linear around you know marching periplus is far more important mm -hmm. and i think again with caesar in the gallic war and in the civil wars 
more in the Gallic War than in the Civil Wars. That idea of I put it in stores here, I put it in stores here, I put it in stores here is again, if you think of it in a mapping sense, um, where where the where the ration stops are that you know along the way there's this march to there, this march to there, this march to there, but there's food on the route. So that sort of idea of logistics and a, a logistical map. Um, and even a retracing of your steps, you know, yes, there might be a straighter line if you sailed directly north, mm. but you can't guarantee that you have uh, a reliable harbour, you can't guarantee that you have water or provisions at that point, so therefore stick stick to the map uh, and the itinerary, and that will have what you need along this route that we've made course, for you. Yeah, and, and you know, for sa especially sailing across sea, it would help to have a compass, which they didn't. Mm. Um, if you think about it, I suspect that um, anybody like us who's an enthusiast uh, of um, military history is probably interested in maps, and we look a lot at maps. But if you think about how you know the modern, um, uh, you, you know your 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 car points the road for you, it basically just said you know from this crossroads go right, follow it for. This distance, mm. go left. Yeah, for this distance, go right. It's essentially the same way. It, it, it's perfectly possible yeah. to go a very complicated route and never actually see a map like we're used to. Yeah, and I think the funny thing about that, of course, is that that kind of mapping and our mapping tools today have almost, in a way, gone right back to the first mapping tools, which essentially ignore geography. You know the fact that this road goes here doesn't tell you that it's a very steep incline that you know you're actually going through the valley of uh, a river that's the only access point in a break of the hills um that you know and a lot of that's um local knowledge only the only way through this is through that pass is not something that would be written on an ancient map it would be something that either is indicated because that's the road uh, like you know the trip the trip to delphi for instance which you know lots and lots of greeks do there's one road in you can't get in there any other way because it's so precipitous and mountainous that actually there's no other options um and i think when you start to think in those terms the you know the the goat track around uh thermopylae and those secret routes that aren't secret routes they're just local routes that only locals know about and they're not on itineraries um that they are kind of these we we see them as secret and we see them as revelations of, of betrayal rather than oh no there's a road that goes that way it's just not on your map but you don't have a map you have an itinerary so yeah let me show you this is how you get there um so i think in those terms uh it starts to make a different picture of how the the sort of the mindset of the ancients worked it also is a very nice bridge to one of the questions, which is how important were local guides in helping <laughs> armies versus established maps or information? Well, the answer is clearly very, um, mm. because the maps will help you get from A to B. Uh, yeah, and I think not decide what's the best position where there's a perhaps a you know where there's a a, a choke point in the mountains that you can exploit or um, a route around such a point that you can take to um yeah and i think that also is um our way of thinking of it. it's a very modern way of thinking of it because the, the local guides you know again when you think thermopylae it's a betrayal as opposed to a local guide um which is a sort of a separate image whereas when you think about kadesh um you know they used local guides to tell them where they're going and that idea that they're spies because they don't tell them that the Hittite armies, you know, camped close by. But if you think of it in mapping terms, um, that, that sort of consideration doesn't come into the, the sort of the thinking. Um, you know, and in Spain, you've got you've got local guides um, for, you know, all of the campaigns that they fight in Spain and probably in Britain as well. Guides is, you know, they're not employed as guides. They might be a tribe or a, or a, a, a population that have invited you in. And therefore, it's in their interest to have you um, know where you're going. The other thing I've always thought about, uh, Alex, uh, well, the, the king of um, Macedonia, who Medizes and yet is known as a Philhellene, um, 
he of course ensures that the Persian army gets through Macedonian territory as quickly as possible uh, and you know speeds them on their way for their conquest of Greece. And A, that gets them out of his territory and he doesn't have to feed them. But B, it's yeah. also from a from a geographical perspective, it's like, yeah, no, go there, go straight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, get that's how you get through my territory. Don't get distracted by that left turn. Just go straight, straight, straight. Um, so I think, yes, they're very important. Uh, and we don't, they're not necessarily mentioned. You know, I think mm. one of the things we often get, like if you think about the March of the 10,000 after Canaxa, they must have had guides to tell them how to get out of Persian territory. That can't have just been a blind marching around in the wilderness for, for however long. Um, they must have used locals, whether, whether voluntary or pressed into service. We don't know. Sure, but they, yeah. You know, some some form of how do we how do we march out of here? Otherwise, they're going to end up in dead end valleys and and dead. and they don't. You know, they never end up and they never make the wrong turn. They're always going somewhere. Um, so it must be. I mean, and the local guides famously, <laughs> Napoleon had when um, pressed into service when he marched up to Waterloo. So that that's mm. that's nothing new. <laughs> No, no, it didn't yeah. change for a very long time, in fact. Yeah. Uh, and and there's examples even more recent in in World War II where you know local civilians help people help units get around the position, uh, yeah. whether well, it's I to think, their advantage I think or not. Even more recent, there's the same things happening in Afghanistan because a satellite image and a drone don't tell you what's on the ground in the Khyber Pass yeah. to this day. You know, and they've been fighting over the Khyber Pass since Alexander's time. Um, they so that, still that idea, don't know. They still don't know. It's like, oh my god. So I think that that idea, and then of course, beyond geography, you've got, uh, you know, maps don't show you where ideo ideology changes or where, you know, tribal territories, which is a nebulous kind of thing. We love a map that shows us where the Huns came from or where Genghis Khan came from or went to, and you're like, this is a vast open plain with no feature on it. It, it kind of it's a vague area of a hundred maybe even more kilometers where maybe there's a border um and yet people on the ground go no no that's their territory this is our territory and you're like uh there's nothing you know there's no river here to delineate your border um what how do you know and they know you know um it's just how it is no i suppose i suppose go, you know border disputes in greece are the same but they had stones to say this is our border and they shifted and hoplites to stand next to them, yeah. Um, I suppose reconnaissance troops, um, when the army's on campaign, would play a big role in this too. But um, we do we do know something about them. Mm. Um, not as much probably as we would like to. Uh, for the Romans, of course, we have the the explorators. Yeah. Uh, and Mind you, I think a while there with that book. <laughs> yeah, we but Yeah, yeah, but I think we actually concentrate more on them when they're not there. You know, at the Battle of Lake Trasimene, when scouts aren't used. Um, yeah, I think I think scouts aren't used at the Battle of Adrianople. You know, it's like, hang on, how did you not know that the, the Gothic cavalry was on its way back? That's odd. Um, so you know, I think that those sorts of troop types were always being used except when they weren't and that's when we emphasize that they weren't used but most of the time they're not mentioned and they are used um so i think that yeah all of those sorts of things are uh, because our sources don't explicitly mention using maps or itineraries we don't necessarily think of generals in hand with itineraries to march next or you know um how they made their roads between points which are dead straight and you know plumbati to to make sure that the road is straight and it kind of you know like like hadrian's wall ignores geography and the mm -hmm. imposition of roman will upon geography uh except at really really bad points where it's like you, where we have to deviate here because we can't make this work um but uh you know and even there i was i just did a some research on the rudge cup um and there's now three plus a couple of fragments that are very similar itineraries. They start on the westward point and they name the forts of Hadrian's Wall going eastwards from the west. Um, and then every now and then they'll miss one out. 
And you're like, hang on a minute, how does that work? How can you miss out a fort on Hadrian's Wall? Um, and I think that itinerary idea is a, is a, a way of uh, making sense of that in your own mind as to why, why that would happen. Maybe in terms of you've always got these uh, armchair uh, geographers like you know, mm. like Ptolemy. Strabo, who were, mm. well, yeah, Ptolemy and then Strabo. I mean, mm. It, mm. you're basically saying, well, what exactly are they basing it on? Um, yeah. It seems to be a, you know, a, a good genre in the ancient world. So yeah, yeah, yeah. How, well, how far does it go? Where are these, you know, the cup, uh, you know, where are the cups being produced and whatnot? Are they being yeah. produced locally, etc.? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, is it someone who actually knows what they're doing or are they making it from mm. miles away? You know, much like um, some of the myths in Herodotus. But I think mm. it's, again, that idea that, oh, no, no, they're systematic. Pausanias's, you know, description of Greece is systematic. He's describing everything. You know, well, no, there's probably some things that he doesn't describe, just as there are things today that don't exist that he did describe. Mm. Um, and in a way, he is very systematic in terms of his tra travels around Greece, it's whereas someone like Strabo is systematic but he's systematic as long as you follow his route and his line of thought um, <laughs> yeah. and if, if it deviates from it that's, you know, you could miss out here something huge that's so, that's everything that's everything i've ever written and every supervisor i've ever had should have heard that comment okay sorry <laughs> I'm, I'm completely systematic and logical if you follow what's going on in my head now don't don't bring your arbitrary logic and you know you haven't made this point into it Oh, uh, Murray, this is going to make editing your articles in the future so much easier. Yeah, I know. I know. You just have to watch the entire back catalog of all the, the podcasts. And then you go, right, well, I know what you're saying. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was expecting that when we discussed this topic, we would just straight go on to the tactical um, and discuss how, how geography influenced battles um and yet nobody's even trying no, to get a we, debate aren't we, dangling aren't, aren't we good and open-minded and and you know looking at big picture stuff yeah um but i think it's i think it's amazing how when you start to think about geography and how geography affected uh battle you actually start to think in a much wider terms, you know, one of the things that whenever I've spoken to a non-military historian, generally in conversations with my wife, um, have always been, why is it that groups of men decide to just meet somewhere and fight? I just wouldn't. And you're like, oh, okay. And when you think about, well, they're both working on the same itinerary, they're going to end up here. That's where they're going to meet. You know, there's not actually other routes to meet at um and you're like oh okay whereas you know in greece thinking about battle sites and a, a style of warfare that is so bizarrely unsuited to the geography of greece which is precipitous and mountainous and not flat plains what you get of course is the reuse of battlefields uh there are multiple battle battles fought at thermopylae which is of course a choke point but there are multiple battles fought at mantinea um, Chironia. The, you know, Chironia Chironia. Well. well well Boeotia in general is, of course, the, the dancing floor of war, according to Plutarch, because it has flat plains. And when you start to look and you look at uh, Tegyra, uh, um, Leuctra, they're very close, Plataea. They're actually not far apart. You're like, well, you, you, were, you were close enough to be fighting the second battle of Plataea when you fight the battle of Leuctra. Uh, but you just tiny, wanted some variety, yeah. Just a tiny, you know. Well, let's name it like, like, like the whole Galgamela Arabella debate. Let's call it Arabella because it's a nicer word than Galgamela. You know, which town do we choose to name the battle after? And that's still to this day. You know, naming yeah. battles. Waterloo is the same. It's actually closer to some other towns. You could have easily called it something else, uh, rather but than. Lalu doesn't really work <laughs> in English. <laughs> Well, exactly. Well, yeah, but they would have just changed it, like wipers. You know, it's like, well, we're not calling it what eep. No, wipers, mate, wipers. So um, that that whole naming convention of battles is such an interesting aspect too. Um, that that these these you know Agincourt that that idea, um, and so many battles are named after not the closest geographical or um, topographical feature, but the the best suited one and that of course changes on the side if you look at the american civil war 
you've got yeah. the, the Union name for the battle and the Confederate name for the battle are different because of their different ideas. You know, Manassas, Shiloh, all of these things, Bull Run, which one's which? Um, they're the same battle. Oh, oh okay. Um, uh, and that might have nothing run, to though. do with the uh, geography at all. It might be to do with... No. You've got the, you know, think of the Peloponnesian War. We're getting that because it's Thucydides coming from a uh, Athenian perspective and whatnot. So it's the yep. Peloponnesian War for them. But on the other hand, the Spartans, they're looking at the Athenian War. So yeah, yeah, but the, again, but the, the Romans Attic as well. The Punic <laughs> Wars. Sorry, I've the, got, got yeah. started now, but yeah, no, no, it's all good. But the Attic War just sounds like something you do on the roof of your house. But um, <laughs> yeah, nice one, mic drop. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you're right. Absolutely, and everything we everything we call it. Um, uh, I mean, you, uh, again, we get that occasionally today, where we get we call it World War Two, and yet you get the the Russian name for World War Two is different. Um, the same but, with but, the, but, but the. We are drifting a bit here, Murray. Oh, it's, uh, no, but it's all it's all tied together. You know, the War of Northern. Yeah, Russia, I know. I mean, and know, warfare is on on. <laughs> Somewhere on planet Earth, at least for but, but, ancient but, but, history, so it's... Okay, you want to segue? I'll segue back. The amazing thing about that, and again, we're not talking tactically, we're talking conceptually that geography defines how we talk about wars. We talk, yes. about, we talk about Persian wars, we talk about Peloponnesian wars, but that's because we've chosen arbitrarily a perspective to take. And there are other perspectives, that, as Mark just pointed out, within the ancient world that name those wars differently you know the battle of marathon probably wasn't called the battle of marathon by the persians they probably didn't even like to mention it um, those things would be named different things simply because of geography yeah the, the peloponnesians are not going to call it the peloponnesian war um so that kind of conceptual basis is is, is geographically based as well but you were trying to say something, I think, about how people ended up um, on a field to fight. And, of course, <laughs> that, has, that has something to do with uh, perhaps logistics and, and making the other guy fight if he doesn't want to. Um, there's some very famous examples of geography playing, uh, as, as we hinted at before, where the scouts clearly didn't do their job and you get meeting engagements or the scouts are doing their job, but they meet the other scouts at the same time. And instead of reporting back, they just get into a fight. Yep. Um, Kineskefale comes to mind. Um, but on the other hand, you get like something like, uh, I'm thinking Antigonus versus um, Eumenes in terms of uh, after the battle of Paratikane, and you get them separating. And when they start coming back together and, um, and Tigonus Monophalanthus comes uh, comes at him in, supposedly uh, in a more direct fashion across uh, open salt plains, and then it says he and his army observe the campfires that Eumenes basically sets up as you know de deception that his army is actually on the ready, uh, already aware of their this, their secret or quiet approach, mm. but there's no mention of scouts there. As such, yeah. it's then that he sort of sends, um, he then diverts his army away from the salt pan uh, and then gets information from local, uh, you know, local population about what's going on. It's, mm. It just strikes me as a, you know, where are the scouts in that case? I mean, you, you hear about Macedonian scouts in other armies, but it yep. seems odd, an odd, um, you know, lack of, of uh, intelligence there. Yeah. I wonder, just thinking about that, whether one of the aspects of Hannibal's crossing of the Alps is actually the the lack of, uh, the, you know, he must have had local scouts to show him a route across the Alps, mm. but no one no one had conceived that there were those things before, which is remarkably, uh, sh not short-sighted, but that idea of there's no geographical ambition. People don't need to cross the Alps, so they don't think about crossing the Alps. Um, you know, and I think those of us that have, that have the wanderlust bug, that idea of well, what's 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 beyond Yonkers, Barnaby, um, and that idea that Hannibal can somehow come into Italy via the Alps in a way that no one's ever thought to do it before, 
uh, that there isn't an itinerary for, there isn't a map for it. Here he, and he shows up shocking us all that he's turned up uh, in, in the Italian peninsula, having done this remarkable deed, um, that idea that that, that that sort of exceeds the boundaries of expectation because they've marched a different way. Are you saying with the, you know, where Crassus and Mark Antony go into Persia, they follow Alexander's route, I think. You know, that, that, that route that Alexander marches is the established mm -hmm. route into the Persian heartland, and that's the route. You don't mm -hmm. think outside the square and go, but hang on, there's a better route. You know, you're only one day march away from a better source of water, which we know now with mm -hmm. our modern technology. Um, but no, no, you do what has always been done, and you march this way, and you go here. Um, and I think that's, and again, probably something that makes some of the conquests of Britain, for instance, interesting, because, of course, it's unmapped um, and it's uncharted in that sense that you're you're essentially drifting through the countryside fighting whoever happens to be tribally there rather than any kind of systematic, well, this is the road we're going to meet at this battle site and fight. Uh, well, actually, then, just this week, you've got the news of the oh. uh, finds that are being made up uh, along the west coast in Scotland that's arguing basically that... Uh, Agricola's advances through the north were he at least had um, two, maybe three different routes being right. taken north. So yeah. that uh, argues against, you know, it just being, um, you know, the tried and tested, but rather, you know, that there is a, you know, a, a larger planet, you know, right. That, right. at work as such. And then that idea maybe, therefore, that, you know, if we make contact, we have... Uh, Intercies between us and our scouts will basically go and tell the other group, well, they're over there, come. <laughs> so then you amass your forces and fight, um, which, you know, again, is, is that idea of guerrilla warfare where you avoid that. Um, <laughs> and then you can strike from the sea because I think we have, we've got one question live by Brian Hartman. Oh, hi, Brian. Um, have we talked through amphibious landings in ancient warfare? That, um, that's, a, that's a great question. And a, amphibious landings. Is, somebody was I, waiting for that one. I don't, I don't think that, that we uh, should keep in mind either uh, D-Day in Normandy or uh, Iwo Jima, right, where you know, they're going across uh, in, in that sense. And I think there, there is an example, I think, uh, from Caesar when he uh, invaded Britain that uh, – that uh, the Roman soldiers were unwilling to get off their ships, and uh, the, uh, the one of the eagle bearers, the uh, the aquilifers of the, one of the legion, of the tent, yeah. right? He had to he had to jump in and say, you know, hey, I'm going, I'm going in. You want to protect your eagle? You better follow me, and uh, that got them in. Uh, what what I think well, was it's the, even better for the D-Day uh, idea of that one. Um, it, the description actually just before that Caesar says that a couple of galleys with catapults actually sail out to the flanks of his invasion fleet and start to pelt the Britons uh, on shore with catapult bolts. So it's really like the battleships going. Yeah. I, I think that was a rare example of a contested landing. I think yeah. that uh, yes. you know, most, most, most I think of, I mean, amphibious landings. I, I don't think there were all that many of them in in that regard. Uh, I mean, it's uh, difficult to a, defend a coastline. Well, the defended coastline is difficult, but there are there are more examples. I mean, you know, the, the, always the question is if you're just transporting troops from one landmass to another and you just put them on shore and they go do stuff, is that an amphibious landing or not? Mm. Um, there is an uh, amphibious landing in the civil war um between um octavian uh and, and mark anthony on the one hand and the liberators on the other when they uh put some troops um mm -hmm. on land in their in the rear of the liberators army there's one example of uh i'll, I'll call it really the result of one I'll, I'll call one example amphibious uh, from 209 bc when scipio uh, takes his troops in. There's a lagoon outside of New Carthage, and 
he uh, learns from local fishermen that the uh, lagoon, the, the water level will go down at a particular time. And he takes his troops in there to attack a relatively undefended part of the wall. So there, there's an amphibious landing in uh, that regard. Um, I, I also noticed there's a question about uh, the use of pontoon bridges, which I, I recall, I, I would say that uh, there's probably meant like bridges of boats where uh, uh, you, in order to cross a body of water, uh, you're going to throw up a temporary bridge where the boats themselves uh, will support the uh, walkway, the causeway. And as at le least on two occasions, there's the one that uh, I think that Darius uses to cross the Bosporus, uh, which is a bridge of boats. And there's also another one from, I, I want to say it was uh, 513 BC. Uh, it, it was what uh, Darius used to cross the Danube. Uh, in Europe when he took his army north to go uh, fight the Scythians. And uh, that bridge was uh, very prominent because uh, the the fact that the Ionian Greeks were tasked to hold that bridge for him uh, was what the reason why he was able to actually extricate his army ultimately mm -hmm. from his uh, expedition into uh, against the Scythians. Uh, so th those use of, of bridges of boats uh, and so, so certainly, you know, you know, I, I don't know if we call them pontoons, but they were certainly used in that same manner. Yeah, I, I think in terms of uh, amphibious landings, you've got Michaela as well. Um, Sphacteria probably, you know, they're trying to break the blockade yeah. at Sphacteria by just crashing boats into the island. Um, there's, I would, you know, would you include Nopactus as well? I know it's not an amphibian landing, but in terms of like all these um, amphibian landings, you're sort of talking about geographical knowledge of the coastline coming into play, you know, whether it be Caesar um, stuffing up his uh, arrival in Britain because he doesn't understand the nature of the, the beaches and how, what depth changes there are or, you know, whatnot. At Norpactus, you've got, you know, Formio, uh, you know, basically corralling the Peloponnesian ships so that they can actually, they actually end up running out of water in mm -hmm. terms of the, the, the amount of space that they've got to actually take in their, um, you know, their manoeuvres that they want to undertake. So in that well, sense, it's, you know, it, it's a knowledge of that local waterway and the depth or the, <clears throat> you know, the currents, etc., that yeah. is coming into play, and that's a, a crucial factor. That, that might even be something at play in um, Argus, Argus Potomai uh, that mm. isn't, yeah. isn't generally considered. Um, I think also Actium, you know, the, I remember reading mm. uh, the book on Actium that came out in 81, that the reason for uh, Antony's ability to escape is that he knew that the wind would shift and mm. he had his sails on the ship. Therefore, when the wind shifted, he can actually sail southwards towards Egypt, um, which again is that knowledge of wind direction, current, all of that sort of stuff. And again, you don't know that unless you're local. But um, he'd been there for a long time. He'd been there yeah. for months. Yeah. So I think that idea that all of those things play into our into their understanding, and in many cases we might not understand it, and it and it takes someone to kind of go, "Hang on a minute, isn't this what's happening?" Um, you, you get know. that in beautifully in the um, what's that? The uh, first Punic War, where you're getting those, you know, the Carthaginian ships running blockades in the western ports of Sicily. Um, basically running with the wind um, in order yep. just to, you know, full steam into ports, full steam out of ports. Um, you know, it's the local knowledge coming in because of their familiarity with the coastline there. Yep. Lo local yep. knowledge like that was what made uh, it possible for Hannibal the Rhodian to get in and out mm. of Lilibium, which was at the time blockaded. Not, not only was besieged by the Romans on land, but it was blockaded by Roman ships at sea. But he knew a particular uh, geographical you know, uh, uh, secret where there's if you kept a particular part of uh, a tower of the uh, uh, of Lilibium's uh, fortified uh, wall in view, you could actually make it through, uh, I guess, particularly, you know, deep water to get in and out. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, the, the Romans had to move heaven and earth to actually uh, capture him while he was doing this. But but the, Ro the Carthaginian uh, blockade runners were remarkably successful because of their mm -hmm. local knowledge of this uh, city. And also the, the, the Siege of Tyre was, was an amphibious uh, operation in large part. The, the probably most famous about the Siege of Tyre was that uh, Alexander had first one and then two causeways built out 
to or, or moles out to the city. But at the same time, he only succeeded in capturing Tyre when he had enough ships to attack it from all sides and bring uh, siege artillery to bear against the walls of Tyre. So, I mean, the, the, the word amphibious is one of those things where because uh, it, it is typically used so much in a World War II context, whether it's D-Day or the operations uh, against the uh, islands in the Pacific, that uh, it, it, it is certainly amphibious in the sense that you were attacking land from the water. Uh, so in that regard, I think Battle of uh, the Siege of Tyre was an amphibious operation, and uh, what was going yeah. on maybe at Lily Bayum too was uh, amphibious in many regards, yeah. although not not nearly as successful. The Lily Bayum uh, remained uh, in Carthaginian hands until the end of the First Punic War; it never mm -hmm. actually fell. So, I think so what thing. Mark is trying to say is that you should never try to picture <laughs> any ancient amphibious landing, mm -hmm. as um, as uh, Ridley Scott's uh, was it. Um, Robin Hood movie. Uh, right. <laughs> well, if, if well, what you have in or, mind of an yeah, amphibious Troy, invasion yeah. is Saving Private Ryan, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I, there, there are certainly there would have been some aspects where someone coming from the shore is under fire from someone on on land. But 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 generally speaking, in the ancient world, uh, I think that you know, it was very hard to defend a coastline consistently. I mean, one of the things that you learn again and again from uh, ancient military history is that navies were generally very poor at defending the coastline and people on land generally had difficulty stopping an enemy fleet from coming ashore and depositing their troops. It was just a difficult thing to do. It was not impossible, but it was a difficult thing to do. Unless you were Archimedes. Well, Sorry. but he but he ended up being stabbed because he was trying to work out. A yeah, problem. but that was because of a land based assault. It wasn't because true. of a um, amphibious landing. That he true, true. Good point. So, good point. Good point. Good point. Yeah. But I've seen the MythBusters episode. You know, I oh, know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, which which doubts everything he did. But yeah. um, the other thing I think that's interesting about Tyre, and I was thinking about Galgamalia as well in terms of geography. What you have in those situations is is not only amphibious, but also not Galgamalia. Um, is man imposing geography on the battlefield? So in Galgamela, of course, they they flatten the um, terrain in the middle so that the chariots can operate effectively, and they don't because Alexander comes up with defences. But at Tyre, he's he's imposing his own geography, and I think it also at Syracuse, where you've got the building of these circumvallations and things like that, Dyrrachium uh, for Caesar and Pompey, that idea of the imposition of of human will on the, on the geography of, of the battlefield is a different kind of mindset in a way. Uh, mostly battles uh, adhere to the contours of the battlefield and the to topography and the geography. You know, we've talked about the choke points, Thermopylae. You're going to end up defending Thermopylae because it's easy to defend. You're going to end up having to attack Thermopylae because it's easy to defend. Um, there's lots of battlefields where they are the meeting, the natural meeting point of two armies. The Trasimene is the natural route that Hannibal would take. Um, so therefore that defense of that, there are lots of battles at river crossings. And again, when you think about um, amphibious in that regard and pontoon bridges, there are only several places where a river can be crossed. You can't just cross a river wherever you want, unless you're Caesar and build a bridge. Uh, in which case it's going to be obvious because it's going to be, they're building a bridge over there. Um, but, you know, if you think about the Hydaspes, if you think about the Granicus even, it's like, well, it has to be at A, B or C because those are your three crossing points. So the battle has to occur at one of them. Um, and if you think about uh, the battle of the Trebia, um, so many battles that happen at river crossings. Um, and I wonder what you were saying, Mark, about the inability of ancient, um, armies to resist a landing. The other fact of that, of course, is that, yeah, but it's not a decisive encounter. Mm. If, you're, if, if I repulse your landing, I haven't beaten your army. There's almost well, a... an ancient, if you kick an ancient fleet, um, you know, if you, if you stop it from landing, they might run into logistics problems pretty mm. quickly. They, but I generally can't just yeah. turn around and uh, just go back to where it mm. came from. Mm. But there's almost that that sort of unspoken agreement that we'll let you land and then we'll beat you. Um, you well, know. No, there's a very effective, when you've got uh, Perdiccas taking his army down to take on uh, Ptolemy's Egypt, and of course he tries to make it a um, 
you know, a, a two prong attack and bring in his fleet to support his land base and take his land base down by the Fort of Camels. The Ptolemy's forces mount a very good um, defence against the fleet, forcing the fleet to turn around and play no part in it. And I think it has a, you know, it has a huge effect. Mm -hmm. And then you have the exact same thing happen uh, later on when Antigonus tries to do the same thing. And again, he is trying to take his fleet to support his land forces. And because the fleet, again, makes no impact um, into the Nile Delta, it basically means that his land forces are... You know, up against a you know an impossible task because they is haven't that, got that support. Is that is that successful defence also local knowledge? You've got you know residents oh, yeah. of the Nile Delta defending their delta against invading armies that don't actually know what they're doing or where they're coming. And you've got um, and you've got the uh, captains of those fleets who are not um, working with local knowledge going up the the mouths of the delta. So they're yeah. sort of you know again a little bit um i wouldn't say needle in a haystack but they are um just you know feeling around for what yeah. they're hoping to find basically there. well again i think you know xerxes invasion it's like well you lost half your fleet because you didn't know the local conditions and you were going to get your fleet destroyed by storms which all of the greek fleet knew about so uh, you know i think uh, allowing uh, salamis too you know that there's there's the the, the use of of geography to restrict a battlefield to make sure that you can, you know, use your own smaller fleet to your advantage, and the enemy's larger fleet can't operate. Um, I think those those sorts of things are probably more common than we realize. Geography was extremely uh, important to virtually all naval battles. Most uh, just all about almost all naval battles occurred uh, within sight of land, very close to the coast. Uh, and that was due to several factors that had to do with the nature of ancient uh, fleets. Uh, ancient uh, galleys, they had carried a lot of men compared to the actual size of the ship itself, which meant that they did not have uh, much room for uh, food or water, which itself uh, you know, was relatively heavy. So uh, you would have had to cons constantly uh, bring your fleet onto shore for a number of reasons. Uh, each ship would have to have their men take their meals whether it's uh you know lunch or uh dinner ashore uh you'd have to allow the men time to stretch their legs uh, uh just get get out of their ship because they're crammed into a small galley for hours on end and they would also have to find food ashore and one of the things that is uh, constantly seen in thucydides is that uh the greeks are uh, often asking local uh, people to set up a market where their uh, rowers can go and get food because they they don't actually have food on the ships for them. Uh, an another thing is, is that war galleys had difficulty sailing against uh, adverse winds, which meant that uh, since you can't make any headway if the winds are too heavy, you have to uh, put yourself ashore and uh, wait it out until the winds change. And finally, because of the fact that just about all of these fleets are moving along the coastline, they will typically run into each other on the coastline in time for battle, or mm. in, at, at the time of battle, uh, which is why they're always inside of, uh, of land. Uh, it, it wasn't that the ancients couldn't do a straight shot across uh, a large body of water. So for example, if you were sailing to Crete, or you're going from Tunisia to Sicily, or from uh, Sicily to Tunisia, uh, or, or maybe uh, from uh, Africa to Spain, you would have sailed over water for a few days at a time but for the most but, part but in those cases you're always within sight of land if you're traveling sailing from tunisia to sicily you will be able to see the coastline of sicily what, what one of the one of the things is is is, is that it, but, but you're, you're crossing open water i think is what i meant to say you're crossing yeah. open water so what one of the things about uh these uh you, you would have done that but for the most part uh, fleets prefer to travel along the coastline for the uh, for the, for the reasons that mm. I, I, I mentioned earlier, um, and, and we see that the because all these battles are taking place in the coast, the coast line itself, the shore becomes a, a factor in many of these battles. For example, the Battle of Echnomus in 256 BC, uh, the Romans and Carthaginians are fighting, and one of the Roman uh, uh, squadrons is actually trapped up against the shore by the Carthaginian left wing and is only saved when the victorious Roman squadrons elsewhere 
come to its aid. And, one, and, and once you're trapped against the shore and you have no means of, a, uh, of escape uh, as a galley, typically what would happen is, is that you, the uh, rowers would abandon their ships and then flee inland. That happened also several times in the uh, Peloponnesian War. Another example of the coast becoming uh, a hindrance uh, to one of the fleets was at the Battle of Drapana in 249 BC, in which uh, uh, Publius Claudius Pulcher, the, you know, the new the Roman commander, consul for that year, uh, takes the Roman fleet on a, on a daring nighttime mission against Drapana, which is one of the uh, Carthaginians' uh, fortified ports in Sicily during the First Punic War. And he times it so that he's appearing right outside of Drapana at sunrise. And he achieves complete surprise. It, it seems, however, that he's at the back of the, uh, his fleet. Maybe he's in the rear to you know, keep all the stragglers uh, you know, going forward because it's, uh, they're in the dark. Uh, but what happens is that that means that the lead elements of the Roman fleet are going into uh, the Drapana port before Pulker even shows up. And he is delayed also, the legendary story goes, is that the sacred chickens that the Romans would always take to mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. them to judge pre-battle omens, they didn't want to eat their food, and that was a bad omen for uh, the coming battle. So uh, Pulker says, well, if the chickens won't eat, let them drink. And he takes the chickens and uh, throws them overboard, and it's a sacrilege. Uh, whether the story is true or not, who knows? There's probably an ex post yeah. facto justification why the Romans, <laughs> what happens next. So what happens is, is that the Romans are coming into this port of Drapana, but the Carthaginians have seen them coming. So, But even though they're surprised, the Carthaginian admiral is named uh, Adherbal, and he manages to get his entire fleet, everybody, immediately onto their ships and they're rowing out. So what happens is, is that as the Romans are going into the port uh, entering from the south, the Carthaginians have already put to sea and are heading out westward. So finally when Pulker arrives and is able to get his ships in a semblance of order, uh, not only are the Carthaginians standing out to sea, but Pulker chooses to place himself with the uh, land at his back, right? Because uh, he if I, I, they, they suggest that maybe he was looking at it from a perspective of he'd at least be able to retreat onto land if the battle went against him. And it did because, uh, in large part, the Romans had no room to maneuver. That is, the Carthaginians, with, with, being with, with the sea at their back, could charge in, uh, a ram, and then retreat. All right. They had the advantage of mobility, whereas the Romans, they had nothing behind them to retreat to. They would ground themselves. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 uh, after being mauled, uh, Polker, who had brought at least, I think, 123 ships with him to Drapana, he leaves, uh, I, I think he leaves only about 30 ships. So he loses dozens, almost his entire fleet. And it's a gigantic victory for the Carthaginians, mainly because the role of geography that is he uh, shoreline was there there was nowhere to retreat to and the romans just could not uh, they basically trapped themselves yeah i think i think when you start to think you know big picture geography is always at play uh mm -hmm. you know if you think about kind of scyphali or pitna you know geography ends empires um in that regard um and i think that's something that when we think about ancient warfare it's not something we concentrate on but you could you could easily do uh, an, an account of every battle we've ever talked about in regard to geography. Oh, yeah, um, you know, and how how did the armies end up where they ended up? Geography. Why did they fight the way they fought? Geography. Um, you know, and I think again, that's one of the unanswered questions about the development of hoplite warfare, um, whether it's a revolution or whether it's a long development over time in a in a system of terrain that doesn't suit it. You know, of all the um, the Greek city states or the Greek um, populations, the cavalry based ones tend to do a warfare that suits their terrain. Even the Macedonians, it's like, well, their mountainous terrain doesn't suit this massive phalanx of, of pikemen. And yet that's what you develop. Um, Crete, you know, when you read about Crete and Plato's laws, the whole reason that the Cretans develop into archers and nimble runners is because of the terrain of Crete. 
that's what their terrain suits. And you're like, oh, well, hang on a minute, but that's not what the rest of Greece does. Why is that? And it's interesting because it plays against what you would expect of the terrain. Whereas, you know, massed heavy infantry chariots in, you know, flat desert terrain of, of the uh, Persian Empire and places like that makes much more sense. Cavalry on the terrain, you know, on the on the steps of the the Hunnic steps, that makes sense. I believe that the explanation for the Samnites' relatively flexible open order style of warfare was because uh, central Italy, south central Italy was uh, a hilly terrain and they, they, they couldn't just line themselves up in one you know, big uh, Greek style phalanx and fight mm -hmm. uh, effectively. And in fact, the, the Romans, it is suggested, uh, adopted their relatively flexible open order legion uh, from the Samnites, that, that style of warfare. So cer certainly I think that uh, terrain matters a lot. And if you are a relatively, uh, a people living in a relatively circumscribed area, for example, such as the Samnites, uh, uh, attuning your style of combat to the ground that you're going to be fighting over uh, makes a lot of sense. And, and it turns out that, it, that the Roman legion was so flexible that it could be adapted to uh, fighting in an open plain or in much more uh, much hillier or more uh, close terrain. Indeed. I think we can keep talking about this forever. <laughs> um, but that might turn into a very long podcast. Uh, but let's let's try and um, close with one final question uh, that's been posted on the uh, on the public comments. Uh, SN Pi asks: Were key passes not completely fortified to protect empire? For example, the Darial Pass. Um, and the answer is: Who no. wants to go? Well, I think. Well, I think. There are attempts to fortify passes, but they're always garrisoned, um, and those garrisons tend not to stick around. Um, again, you know, Thermopylae, there's there's a thousand um, Phokians defending it, and they don't defend it. Um, you know, even when you have the barbarian invasions, you've got a, a Limes uh, with a fort system, again, that gets breached. Um, and I wonder if a lot of the ancient warfare, like with the amphibious landings we were talking about, is reactionary. You know, we will react to something happen rather than try and prevent it from happening in the first place. Um, I think, you know, the defense of passes and the defense of, of pre-made positions is a very tricky thing in ancient warfare terms. Um, uh, also, you have to be lucky enough that the pass is, um, just happens to be the border of your country. Um, yeah. that you want to defend. And of course, for the Roman Empire, uh, by the later stages, uh, the, the later um, eras. Well, exactly. It's, you know, but also, the, the uh, Alpine passes, some of the Alpine passes are important and they do get uh, reinforced. Well, you but, think yeah, of, you're right. If you don't maintain yeah. the fortress and you don't keep yeah. a garrison there. And if you're, then, you know, the Silesian gates, it's like, well, Alexander could have been stopped in his tracks there very easily. Mm. Um, but it's in the middle of Cilicia. Why would you fortify a pass that's in the middle of your territory? And it might not have originally, it would make the perfect border, but at some point someone's conquered both sides of it and gone, well, this is all now one place. Uh, you know, the Amanus gates, these gates, the Syrian gates, so many gates that would be perfectly blockable, but that when you get a giant empire, the only ones that make sense to defend are on the borders. Um, you know, it's and, also and, a matter of the local tribes in these areas um, looking at, you know, what is their interest? Do they, you know, they've got to make a decision of do they make these um, these passes available to armies like Alexander the Great coming through? Or do you, you know, there, there's the area of Cappadocia that, um, you know, traditionally you've got the tribes through there asking for um, payment to go through. Mm -hmm. And the other example is the... Um, uh, through the uh, mountains on the way to Spain, that you've got um, references by the Romans constantly, as uh, Sertorius, you know, famously saying that he uh, he values time uh, rather than uh, time is more valuable than his money, so he's happy to part with his money. Um, mm -hmm. You know, these, these tribes are sort of making a quick buck, but at the same yep. time, judging you know how far can you push an army, um, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. etc. So, 
<laughs> there's, more, there's more to it than just simply saying, you know, why can't somebody shove some troops there? Mm -hmm. so. But also, and I think, again, it comes full circle because that's that's how I roll. Um, get it? Full circle. No, okay, fine. And when you come back to these itineraries... That too we, late yeah, for it took, that, me, took me some time. No, it's early for me. It's, I'm just getting warmed up. Um, when you think about the Battle of Issus, for instance, where Xerxes is able to get... Sorry, Darius is able to get behind Alexander um and that that idea of the itinerary map which we began our discussion with alexander's walking down the coast and there's another route that he isn't told about doesn't know about hasn't defended hasn't sent men to find out you know he knows that darius is somewhere near he wants a battle with darius darius gets behind his route of march so he has to turn around and come back and fight the battle of issus um so that those sorts of things are probably a combination of all the things we've talked about. Local knowledge, oh, of course there's another route. We just go this way. Um, and all of that's a, an amazing uh, defining factor in how ancient warfare is fought. Uh, well, I think um, I think we'll keep it to that. Uh, we might come back to it someday, or maybe more than once. Um, but I think tonight I'm going to thank the people who have been watching. I hope you enjoyed the show, and um, um, everybody else will hear you very soon. <laughs>